Thanks for having accepted to donate their time to our initiative and all the participants for their interest. Uh, as Ilaria said, my name is Maurizio Bettiga and I collaborate with her uh, in the coordination of the uh, Vanguard Initiative Bioeconomy pilot. During this brief introduction that I will give, I will very quickly talk about the Bioeconomy pilot and then especially about the structure of what we are building now, which we called Biopolymers Demo Case. Is everybody seeing my screen? Good. So as Ilaria mentioned, uh, the Vanguard Initiative promotes interregional cooperation for transforming and emerging industries. And the actions of, within Vanguard are based on the so-called pilots. Uh, pilots uh, cut across different advanced industrial disciplines. We know, of course, today we will focus on bioeconomy. The bioeconomy, uh, bioeconomy contributes to the development of, of new industrial applications. And since this, this is within Vanguard, we leverage on interregional cooperation according to the smart specialization strategy. The bioeconomy pilot has a number of uh, Vanguard region uh, committed and it's uh, led by Lombardy and Randstad. And uh, it is uh, the actions within the bioeconomy pilot are divided among three so-called demo cases. And today we will sort of launch the, for the fourth one. The three demo cases are bioaromatics, lignocellulosic biorefinery and liquefied biomethane. And uh, I should say that um, the leaders of at least two of these demo cases are participating in this, uh, this uh, web meeting, in particular, uh, Willem Sederel as the leader of the lignocellulosic biorefinery demo case and Ludo Dils as the leader of the bioromatics demo case. So uh, if you have uh, questions related to these topics, uh, you are free to uh, ask them and we will see if we have space to reach out to them. Uh, the the um, uh, interregional cooperation has led to certain achievements thanks to the action of the bioeconomy pilot in 2019. Two business plans on bioaromatics and liquefied biomethane have been produced, in particular lignin to bioaromatics by the bioaromatics demo case, and a business case on the use of liquefied biomethane for road transportation within the uh, liquefied biomethane demo case. Uh, there has been there have been a number of uh, initiatives, uh, projects, and events, uh, and stakeholders gatherings, which is what the bioeconomy uh, pilot is most active for. Uh, let me just uh, quickly go to the benefits. Why should one join this initiative? Why should one uh, be kept uh, updated? Well, because the mandate we have and the mission we have is to promote new industrial cases. So, uh, re, uh, for example, industry can access uh, other regional competencies and make contact and build relationship with, uh, with other European partners. Uh, the region themselves uh, have the benefit of promoting their domestic uh, industry and collaboration with other European regions. Let me now talk about the, what, we are what, what you are going to call the biopolymer demo case. The biopolymer demo case wants to create interregional value chain by matching the polymer market applications, the existing ones and prospective ones, with new bio-based polymer technologies. We would like to do this mostly adhering to the uh, strategy of market pool. As you know, uh, there, have been, uh, there have been a number of efforts within the bio-based production and bio-based technology development uh, of the so-called technology push. And that has been successful only to a certain extent. We would like to adopt the so-called market pool strategy as much as possible, actively scouting for applications owners and matching them with the technology owners so that biopolymers can be facilitated in entering the market. And I have used red font here because I expect that among the audience, 
there are some, especially application owners, some industry stakeholders, some subjects active on the market. Please step forward now or later via email to myself and Ilaria because it is our job to connect you with those that have the technologies that could satisfy the need for your applications. For example, the need of switching to bio-based polymers. What are we going to listen to today within this strategy? There are some cases which we can already call use cases within the biopolymer demo. And I have divided roughly them in two, but this is not really engraved uh, in stone. Uh, we can say that the first ones would focus on applications. And we will hear Maciej Guzik from the Institute of Catalysis and Surface Chemistry of the Polish Academy of Science, talking about biopolymers for medical applications and in particular, polyhydroxyalkanoids. Then uh, I will, uh, on behalf of an Italian company, talk about biopolymers for fashion. The Italian company is called Vegea Biotech and I will briefly introduce you its technology to, for the production of bio-based synthetic leather. Then we have other cases which I uh, roughly identified them as focusing on raw material supply. So uh, we will have Rob Elias from Bangor University in Wales uh, talking about the Bread for PLA project, a demonstration plant project to produce polylactic acid biopolymer from waste products of bakery industry. And also Michael Booth from Vertoro and Eindhoven University of Technology describing the Goldilocks technology proprietary of the Vertoro company a lignin-based platform for fuels, chemicals, and materials. And one of the panelists might be thinking, I haven't forgotten, but it is really the case of saying last but not least, because we have a very nice conclusion by Uro Novak of the National Institute of Chemistry, talking about te a technological platform for transferring advanced biopolymer solutions from lab to market. And uh, I know it is difficult to read, but I have put it there because this is really embracing all our use cases and it is uh, very close to uh, our overall strategy within the demo case. So with this, I will leave the word to the speakers and uh, uh, please don't hesitate to ask questions uh, in case uh, you have. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen and invite uh, Maciej Guzik uh, to give his presentation. Thank you Mauricio for uh, the introduction. So today I will tell you uh, about the biopolymers uh, demo case that we are building in Małopolska with collaboration of some regions within the Vanguard initiative. And I divided my presentation into three parts. Uh, I'll tell you about the production and applications of the biopolymers named polyhydroxyalkanoids. I'll tell you about the expertise and concepts that I managed to gather in Małopolska. And then I'll move to interregional collaboration. So uh, biopolymers are increasingly being produced uh, in the world. And there is a lot of interest uh, why we need to invest our time and money into those polymers. Uh, half of the bio-based, uh, biodegradable polymers are, um, are biodegradable. So within these, there is a small share growing uh, from year to year on PHA, so polyhydroxyalkanoids. The main issue is still the price of those polymers, as you can see here on the right. Um, in uh, Europe, it's around four euros per kilo. Uh, that is uh, directly connected with the amount of factories being able to produce those types of polymers. So what are the polyhydroxyalkanoids, so-called future bioplastics? Uh, these are uh, bacterially synthesized biopolymers inside of the bacterial cells as those granules. And they are characterized by uh, a lot of different physical chemical properties uh, because of uh, up to 150 different building blocks. So we can achieve polymers of varying uh, physical chemical properties. For example, short chain length PHAs, PHB, which is very brittle, through increasing the chain length of the monomer, being, uh, building those polymers to elastic and glue-like polymers. 
because of those uh, variety of physical chemical properties, they have already found a lot of applications in industry, especially for packaging, uh, consumer products, food services, agriculture, and also medicine, because they are uh, not only biodegradable, but they are biocompatible. So it means that one can create a product out of it and make it a medical product, product that will be recognized as a one's um, natural um, substituent. Uh, because they have so many different uh, physical chemical properties, they are proposed to uh, enter a lot of new niches in uh, near future. So what I managed to build up so far is a great consortium here in Poland that we are able to produce uh, biopolymers from raw materials and we are able to process those polymers uh, using expertise of polymer chemists and material scientists and also test those polymers for their uh, medical applications uh, using advanced in vitro and in vivo testing. On the other hand, uh, we have also a strong economic, economic expertise uh, that enabled us to reach towards the industry, uh, for example, in medical areas, and on the other hand side, uh, through uh, advertising uh, our initiative within Małopolska, industry reached to us for certain technologies on production and using biocatalysis, for example. So I managed to uh, save, uh, secure money for a big um, investment that enabled me to start being, building an exemplary PHJ bioraffinery block that holds facilities for upstream, downstream, and for PHA polymer productions. We are using, we are focusing on uh, plant oils, which are, which can be virgin or, or post consumers, and using their sub, um, components like fatty acids and glycerols to produce a variety of different polymers. Then those polymers can be converted to uh, their blends and also some ceramic composites. So my main focus is uh, for production of biopolymers, especially for medical uses, as I have finished already two projects on in that part. So we have produced functional materials uh, for implants, uh, and wound patches that are being already tested in animal models. There are also uh, technologies that we are um, developing, as I mentioned, those blends, those composites that are uh, aimed to produce pre-products for industrial applications. Also, uh, there are some small additional um, technologies uh, derived from the main bioraffinery block that can produce natural adhesives, so MCL PHAs from plant fatty acids, which is very nice, sticky, gluey, and bio completely biodegradable. Uh, we are producing some small molecules of uh, medical importance, and um, also we are able to produce low-grade biopolymers for further conversion to uh, for fuel additives like methyl esters. So I uh, managed to secure up to now around 3.8 million euros uh, to cover all those areas with a focus on medical applications. However, those production technologies uh, from oil to PHA can be used also in the industry. When it comes to interregional inter collaboration, um, we can offer uh, those technologies that I've been talking about. So PHA blends, PHA blends with other biopolymers, and those that can be used for uh, packaging, films, and agriculture applications. Uh, we have also PHA uh, blends and composites developed for medical applications. Uh, we can use uh, our technologies to convert um, undeveloped carbon sources like glycerol to polymers and energy sources, as I mentioned, uh, those esters from bulk biomass containing high PHA content. Uh, what we are actually missing a little is an industrial pool, as a market pool, as um, Maurizio said before. We already see that some local partners are coming to us looking to implement those technologies to change their daily 
operations. However, we can uh, provide, as you can see, uh, under commercialization, those technologies and products uh, to fill into those niches. We already are cooperating as Małopolska with two regions of uh, initiative, uh, Vanguard Initiative, which is Slovenia, with Dr. Uroš Novak, who will be talking today about um, product development, and with Professor Alexander Steinbuchel, who is um, cooperating with me on process development for our technologies and products. Thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much, Maciej, for a nice presentation and, and uh, very interesting knowledge. Now we know uh, that uh, you have come a great length in your institute for regarding PHA piloting. Uh, I will monitor the chat. Uh, we, we have a few minutes for questions. If a question pops up, I will relate to the panelists. I will start while uh, questions appear with the, with the question for Maciej. I also invite the other panelists to feel free to, to, um, to ask questions. So here I see two questions on uh, uh, the Q&A space. Uh, so, uh, well, I will, uh, I will read the question that says, can you give more information on the DSP of PHA and what constraints need to be applied for medical application? I, I see this is quite a technical and advanced question. Marseille, I leave it to you if you can give a short answer. Uh, otherwise, uh, I will put you in contact with the person that asked the question so you can give a more extensive reply. Can I see the chat because I didn't get... You should be able to see it on the lower panel of your screen. It says Q&A as the last icon on the right. Okay. Um, can you tell me what is DSP because I... Downstream I processing. Okay, downstream processing. So, um, we are producing those uh, polymers in gram-negative bacteria. Uh, so, everyone knows that they produce also some um, endotoxins. However, we have applied a technology that purifies the polymers uh, from those endotoxin, and this is a relatively easy technology that um, uses, um, first of all, um, a correct fermentation medium to decrease the production of undesired uh, endotoxin, and then we are using purification technologies in downstream processing using activated charcoal, which uh, greatly reduces um, the amount of endotoxins. So that's the, the answer to the first question. We can talk about that later if you need to more, know more details. And the second one, what is the feedstock source for your PHAs, sugars, fatty acids, waste stream? So we are focusing mainly on um, natural plant oils and so we are hydrolyzing these to fatty acids and glycerol. We are also working on not only fatty acids derived from oil, but um, shorter medium chain length fatty acids like C8, octanoic acid, hexanoic, uh, nonanoic. The funding you received for your work is this coming from subsidies from EU programs, from industry, or a mix of both. So uh, the biggest grant is from Strategic Polish Grant, and it's uh, Polish um, funding, national funding. And I've got also uh, great support from industry, uh, Polish industry. So this is a mix of both. Very nice. Thank you, Maciej. Uh, there, there's a fifth question. Uh, no, uh, invent, invent your no bio is not part of my group. Then, then I, I do have a question which I think uh, 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 the answer is important for, for the attendees to know um, uh, if and how they can access your facilities. So my question is, what is the mm, polymer production capacity, the scale of your facility? And... Um, if you can very briefly say how one can or if one can access it for potential pilot or demo uh, studies. Okay, so for now, uh, I finished the first year of the project. We have uh, two 5 liters and 30 liter fermenter uh, standing and operating. Uh, next year, 
uh, we are planning to finish building a building with the work has started we are waiting now for all the paperwork uh, to start uh, the, the site and we will have their 200 liter fermenter um, for the next two years the fermenters uh, will be blocked for commercial uses as uh, it is written down in the um, project agreement however after that uh, we can be testing for uh, industrial application with industrial partners in the meantime we have some small fermenters uh, that can be used also for um, technology checkup if your substrate works well with our technology so more details i need to contact uh, i need to be contacted to to discuss that yes of course thank you very much Massier. and everybody should feel free to to uh contact Massier. well i don't want uh, him to be dumped with emails so please feel free to write us first and uh and and then uh, we will be very happy to connect you so I think we are, have, we are keeping perfect timing and then uh, we can uh, welcome the next uh, speaker. Uh, thank you again, Massier, and I will leave the floor sure. to, to uh, Rob. And your microphone is muted, so um, I will uh, just introduce Rob from the Bangor University talking about the Bread for a PLA project. So here we will focus on a special uh, uh, raw material and hence developing a little bit of a, an overview of the, the type of work that we do as a research centre. But the main focus is to talk about this project. Um, and I'll, I'll go through some of the project findings, the approach that we used, and then finish with some thoughts about some of the opportunities, but also the challenges that um, still need to be addressed when we look at the use of waste materials for as a feedstock for, for biopond production. So I hope there's, there's some further discussion and thoughts about that, how we can address those in new projects in the future, take some of the learning from this project uh, into, into new projects. Okay, so very, very quickly, just a couple of slides on the background of the centre. Uh, we're based in, the, our region is Wales. It, it's just to the north, northwest of England. We're based at Bangor University, but we are a specialised research centre that's always focused on, on biomass technology. So we're very interested in looking at sustainability um, and it covers a, a wide cross section of industries from, from construction through to healthcare. But mo more recently, really since 2006, 2007, we got very interested in biopolymers and we saw an opportunity to look at uh, new technologies that would have different end of life fates would improve the environmental performance and be and have better and better end of life uh, issues as well and that drew us into the packaging sector in particular um, and one of the areas that we've specialized in is the ability to prototype materials so we're very interested in taking the biopolymers and seeing if we can make them into prototype materials and test those prototype materials and to, to do that we have a a big uh, industrial facility a building um, here on Anglesey where I'm based at, at the moment on, on an island just off North Wales and in that building we have a, a lot of pilot scale equipment which we use to demonstrate these types of technologies and an example of the type of equipment that we have here is a, a compounder extruder which we can also form sheet material on and we're very uh, experienced in using PLA, PHA, P PHB, PBS, all the different off-the-shelf polymers that we can source at the moment and blending those to make materials, packaging trays to test those, measure their barrier performance, things like that. So that's our, our background and where we've come from and why we get excited about uh, biopolymers for packaging applications. 
Um, another key thing, sorry, I forgot. Another key thing I'd like to introduce today in this talk is LCA. And that's really important. All our research has an LCA running in parallel with it to look at the energy inputs and outputs and the material balances as we're doing the research. So for example, all our pilot plant equipment that you can see here has LCA monitoring capabilities. So we're measuring those at a pilot scale, but we're also, when we do an industrial trial, we try and capture that information. And that's another call for thought from everybody today is thinking about improving the energy data that we have for biopolymers and their applications because that's really important to account for that better because many of the inventories inventories that we have on the databases are, are based on old data which may not be appropriate for, for bioplastics or may not even exist for some of the bioplastics at the moment so that's another important thing i'll come back to that later Okay, uh, I'm just going to run through now uh, a project. It was actually started back in 2011, so a while ago now, um, and it ran. It was meant to run to 2014, but we had a, we suffered a few delays, um, and we had a few uh, extensions to that. So I think it finishes finished around 2016, something like that, and it was funded through the Life Program on the environmental side, and it was all to do to look at um, looking at alternative sources for biopolymer production. And uh, I'm just going to summarize some of the key findings from that today. First of all, the project partners, it was quite a small group. Um, it involved CETEC in Spain. They were focused on um, the baking side. So there was this connection to the bakery industry and an understanding of some of the wastes that were generated in that sector and could they add value to that. ATB, ATB in Potsdam, Germany, they helped with doing the fermentations ourselves, looking at the chemistry side of it, taking the lactic acid from ATB and making that into polymer. And then AMPLAS, I'm sure many of you know in Spain, really specializing in thinking about the testing and processing of the plastic and the plastic format packaging, the packaging formats that they worked with. So you can see every step of the process sort of uh, covered by the partners there. So it was a very good balance of partnerships within this project funded by LIFE. So the idea, as I mentioned, it's to take this sort of circular economy approach to take um, the bakery wastes, which could come from misshapen bread uh, in the production of in the big production factories the big bakeries um, be able to use that as a feedstock so we did a lot of analysis of different types of bread waste from lots of different regions from in particular germany and spain we looked at the impact and the quality of that on the um, on the fermentation process and then the lactic acid was supplied to us. We made PLA and then we supplied the PLA to Amplas, who then produced different packaging formats that were then tested by the uh, CETT to look at the um, efficacy of that packaging as a bakery product. So they were making clamshells for bakery products, uh, liners and uh, films for and, uh, uh, films surfaces films for uh, packaging bread back into the system. So that's circular economy approach that people talk a lot about these days. Okay, um, so the type of, you know, um, Marcy was also talking about having pilot scale facilities. I think this is really critically important in this area to be able to scale things up. And this is an example of the 50 liter uh, uh, reactor that we have in our Mona facility. Um, and this is the equipment that we use to start that scale up process. So we were taking, uh, preparing the lactide um, from the lactic acid at 50 liter scales. And then we took that through to um, PLA production in, a, in steel vessels again at a, at a reasonable scale. So in, in that project, we, we were really, and this is probably a little bit too much detail to see, see but we really focused on the material balances going into the process. And this was, I thought, some really uh, very good work early on in the project and very early on in, in this production process as a biopolymers. And we tried to capture 
all the material balances and energy inputs and outputs to look at the yields there. And this one was one of the early ones we did. So we're, we're starting with somewhere in the region of about 20 uh, kilograms of lactic acid and getting it roughly about 10 kilograms of polylactic acid. So it shows some of the yields that we were getting. We also looked at the molecular weight distributions, the melt flow index, the density, the crystallinity, and some of the, the melt temperatures as well. So these are all key technical properties that we need to match compared to the commercially available PLA. And, and we're getting some good matches there, but quite a lot of detailed work needed to do that to map all of that out. Okay, just a summary of some of those properties that I was talking about. These are the key ones. This has got commercial barrier performance, really important for packaging materials. So we compare that to the commercial PLA. You can see their oxygen and water vapor transmission rates. And we were seeing some, some improvements there compared to the commercial grades with ours. And also some improvements in, in some of the properties of our best PLA example. That was example number 38 in a, in a film format. So you can see some really good values there. Okay, um, I mentioned, I'm gonna start trying to summarize now. I mentioned LCA and how important that is. And this is an LCA where we're looking at one of the, the leading ones, PLA from Inagio, the Cargill one. And you can see it has a very low cradle to gate greenhouse gas emission. So that's good. But we think by focusing on um, waste materials, that could be reduced further by using a feedstock that comes from a byproduct from the production process. And one of the reasons is that farm on farm, because these crops are grown at the moment on farms, there's many factors that can affect the eco profile based on the farming practices to produce those materials. And if you look at those different regions, where, and this is another LCA graph showing greenhouse gas emissions associated with one kilo of maize by country, you can see there's a big variation in in the differences there. And the US, as an example, has a very, very productive system. It is uber optimized, it's very optimized. So it's quite difficult to compete against those people, but they're intensively using intensive farming techniques. But looking at the energy, the fertilizers, the types of farming practices has a big impact on the LCA of, of the materials. Okay, so, so a final slide then, um, just some thoughts there. I, I hope, you know, I think there's lots of opportunities to look as waste as feedstocks could be used as sources. We were able to achieve some really interesting um, yields using that from the fermentation process. ATP achieved some really great yields there. Remembering that farming practices, when we're looking at crops that could be used for biopolymers, they have a big influence and land use has a big influence on that LCA and we could avoid some of that by using these waste feedstocks. A big issue is the investment we need to get to the next steps. We, we then struggled, how do we get somebody to invest in the production capabilities to do that? So again, I, mean, I think Mauricio said there's a call there for stakeholders and people interested, the investment community, how do we get to the next steps? and how, how, how do we get that investment, secure, secure that investment to build the factories that could use these feedstocks to make biopolymers in the future. And that's what I'm really interested in, is this inter-regional inter co cooperation through Vanguard to sort of really address that in the, in, in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thanks, thanks, Rob, for the nice presentation. I can see already in the Q and A section that there are um, questions for you. Are you able to see that? Yes, I shall. I'll, I'll go to them now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The so the first one there is what is your PLA production scale now? We 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 got up to on the fermentation side which was the sort of the critical path. We got to about 600 litres in that project. Um, and if you, if there's a final report, you can still find it. You can go, if you Google bread for PLA, um, there is a final technical report, which gives you a bit more information on that. We didn't progress it beyond that project because we came to a, a bit of a wall in terms of investments uh, in production, 
production facilities. And that was, you know, you have to remember this was sort of early on 2000, mid 2000s, um, uh, and trying to tap into the investment community was quite difficult then. The lactic acid that we produced, we, 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 that was quite pure, yes. Um, we, had, we had some really good properties. We were able to match or improve that of some of the commercially available grades. Um, so that, that was um, relatively uh, okay. We didn't see any issues with that. The packaging formats that we produced um, were used in some bakery at a small scale. We, we evaluated those and that they, they were matched the matched the uh, performance there of the commercial grades. The issue with all of these, however, is still production costs and the scale of production and understanding how much raw material, bread waste, um, you know, how much bread waste across the whole of Europe could be used and where, where that would be located and sourced. So is it possible to monitor energy consumption for laboratory studies? Yes, it is. Um, and I'd encourage that as much as possible. Um, it gives you some indica it won't give you the exact information for scaling up, but it will identify hotspots. So if you apply those hotspots, you can then in your scale up processes, tackle where you think most of the energy is going to be used and then look at mitigating that. So looking at technologies that could help reduce that hotspot. So that's a, a, I would encourage that at lab scale, pilot scale, obviously industrial scale, monitoring is even more important. Is bacterial or yeast platform? I, I, I'm not an expert. I think it was a, a yeast one, ATB. You need to check those guys out. They've got some great facilities there for fermentation. I think we were using some of their novel yeast ones um, and they were optimizing those and boosting their performance so that they could increase the yield all the time. So they went through a number of cycles to get something that was very sort of high yielding. Um, yeah, there were issues with um, some of the, some of the, uh, the gypsum, yes, as a, as a byproduct from that as well. I forgot about that, that's a good question. Very good. Uh, yeah. Rob, I suggest that you keep an eye to, to questions that are uh, popping up next and you can okay. uh, 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 reply to those privately. <laughs> yep. And good. we continue, we continue with, the, with the program. I think you can type in the, the, the answer. Yeah. Okay. And we continue with the program with, with Michael from the Toro. That uh, uh, should... Uh, <clears throat> there, there he comes. And yes. We will, yes. So, Michael, uh, please tell us about uh, Vertoro biomass fractionation technology and what one can do with that, especially when it comes to biopolymers. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, start sharing my screen. So we call our technology Goldilocks. Uh, I'll come back to why we call it Goldilocks at the end of the, uh, of the presentation. Uh, and we position this as a sustainable platform for fuels, chemicals, and materials applications. The objective of, of Vertor is to connect worlds. Uh, and to be more specific, we would like to connect the bio-based world with the fossil world, such that we can keep using all existing fossil assets like refineries, infrastructure, petrochemical plants, um, by thinking about a smart way to convert solid biomass into a liquid. Uh, what we found discussing uh, upstream, uh, so we, we focus on lignin as a, as a feedstock, upstream when we talk to pulp and paper, cellulosic ethanol companies, companies in cellulosic sugars, uh, they all say that uh, you need a good lignin business case in order to make the overall business case profitable. For example, in a cellulosic ethanol plant, uh, you produce as much lignin as ethanol. And if you burn the lignin on site uh, as, as a side stream that has no other use, uh, it will be very difficult to make money on the ethanol alone. Uh, um, paper and pulp is a bit a different story, but also there, uh, the business case improves dramatically if you can use lignin for something useful. Uh, the problem with lignin as it comes free from these types of processes is that it's a polymer. 
it comes out in a polymeric form that's not only solid but also non-thermoplastic and non-solvent soluble which means it's very difficult to process uh, downstream in existing fossil assets uh, so what we've done and i'll get to the technology part on the on the next slide is uh, think about a way how we can um, convert this solid lignin into something that's more easy to digest uh, by existing fossil assets. Uh, and this liquid product we call Goldilocks. Then I'd like to take you to uh, our technology portfolio as well as some product market combinations. So how can you use this product? Uh, upstream, we uh, look at biorefinery lignin uh, as a lignin source, but we also look at lignocellulose. Uh, our experience in sourcing biorefinery lignins, uh, but also lignins from pulp and paper, is that it's very difficult to uh, secure contracts for 100 kilotons uh, or, or greater, which we would need for a commercial scale plant. The volumes are simply not out there. And if you can uh, get uh, smaller contracts, um, the prices are, are quite high, substantially higher than the prices you would pay for, for lignocellulose like, like sawdust or, or agro waste which is why we also look at lignin cellulose. Uh, what the technology does is it takes, uh, it takes lignin, if we start with the biofinery lignin, uh, we do a thermal sophrolysis. What is thermal sophrolysis? Thermal sophrolysis is uh, like making espresso, and we take a brown powder and a solvent, add some heat, pressure, and time, and out comes part of the biomass solubilized in the, in the solvent. Uh, and also we have a residual sol solid product uh, that we call char, um, and what happens in this process is that you effectively get a lignin fractionation. Uh, the low molecular weight ol oligomer fraction goes into the solvent, and the high molecular weight, the heavy polymeric fraction, precipitates out. Now we have ongoing projects for this heavy char and bitumen, but also coke, uh, coke projects. Uh, and for the soluble part, depending on the solvent we choose as the carrier for these oligomers, we can go into different markets. Uh, so people in the lignin space are well familiar with uh, polyurethane phenolic resins as, as typical things you could do with lignin. Uh, what we do is we solubilize these lignin oligomers and for example, polyols, and then we have a polyol lignin blend, a liquid that then can be used to make partially bio-based uh, polyurethane. But the phenolic resins, we use phenol as a solvent for these oligomers. Then we have a phenol lignin liquid as a, as a liquid feedstock for phenolic resins uh, manufacturing. On the marine fuel side, we focus on light alcohols like methanol and ethanol. And there, uh, the idea is uh, methanol in particular is already a, a, an up and coming marine fuel to add lignin to that like we add ethanol to gasoline. On the lignin cellulose side, we have to modify the process a bit. We use the same temperature, pressure, residence time, but we need to add also an acid, uh, typically four to eight millimoles. We use sulfuric acid as our, as our go-to acid. Uh, and what happens here is that the lignin cellulose matrix is broken down into its uh, individual constituent components, uh, foremost being cellulose. So about half, if we start with wood, is cellulose precipitating out. It doesn't stay in the solvent. The hemicellulose breaks down into C5 sugars, which are solvent soluble, uh, and about 90 to 95 percent of the lignin um, comes in the form of lignin oligomers also to the solvent phase. And there we have a first a filtration step to get rid of the cellulose. And after that, uh, we can do a liquid-liquid extraction with water ethyl acetate uh, to remove the sugars from, uh, from the oil product. But some applications also allow us to, to keep them in. That's the upstream side and the direct applications of, uh, of the Goldilocks. Uh, uh, just to uh, restate, so Goldilocks is in fact these solvent-soluble thermoplastic lignin oligomers is the brand name we attach to them. We call them Goldilocks. Because it's still lignin, eh, but uh, an oligomer and not a polymer, it still retains all the natural high value uh, functionalities of lignin, like UV stabilization, antioxidant, uh, but also things like lubricity uh, and, and resinous uh, behavior. Uh, so these properties are retained, so we can put this, after we recover it from the solvent, we can put it into the market as a UV 
the stabilizer. So for example, we've made stable PVC Goldilocks blends, uh, blending in 1% or so of Goldilocks to add uh, UV stabilization functionality to PVC as one example. But we've also done blends with, uh, with PLA for instance, uh, for 3D printing. And then we have PLA plus 25% of these lignin oligomers, which are perfectly compatible with, with PLA uh, to make uh, a 3D printing filament. Another way to go about it is to say, look, I want platform chemicals. And there uh, we take a blend of methanol and these lignin oligomers and feed it into a fluid catalytic cracker, a fluid catalytic cracker like you would find uh, at most oil refineries. And what happens there under those severe conditions is that the methanol acts as a hydrogen donor as it converts to light olefin, CT, C2, C3 olefin. Uh, and as it's donating hydrogen, uh, the lignin oligomers break down uh, or depolymerize effectively down to PTX or benzene, toluene, xylene type of type of molecules. Uh, another route we can go about it is uh, hydrogeoxygenation. We also have some IP there uh, to go to more like monophenols, and from monophenols we can go to selectively to to phenol. There's also a lot of uh, market interest for bio-based phenol. Uh, it's a lot to digest, uh, happy to share these slides, uh, they're also online, uh, but this is basically our technology portfolio, IP portfolio, and also the different uh, product market combinations we're addressing with our Goldilocks platform. So in terms of roadmap, uh, where are we now in volumes? Um, these numbers here are tons per annum. Uh, we started in 2017 uh, at Eindhoven University of Technology in a lab there we could do some kilograms, uh, nothing, uh, nothing too fancy. Uh, we've since then, uh, since 2019, been piloting at two sites, Iowa State University, where they have a continuous biomass liquefaction pilot plant uh, that we use, and also Brightlands, which is in the south of the Netherlands, as a, as a pilot plant that, that we're using. There we can do some tons per annum, and not also not uh, not huge volumes, but already in the in the tons. Uh, from there, we recently announced uh, in a press release, joint press release with CCAP, which is a Swedish cellulosic ethanol producer, uh, that we're going to demo our technology uh, at their existing demo plant. Uh, CCAP is operating a, a demo plant using steam explosion. Uh, and fortunately uh, for us, the steam explosion reactor can accommodate our sophologist recipe quite, quite easily. Uh, and from there, uh, these demo trials at uh, already kiloton scale will hopefully be completed by the end of the year. And then we'll have everything we need uh, to go to the next phase, which will be a commercial scale plant with CCAP or uh, we're also talking to, uh, to other potential partners to scale up together. Uh, and this will be a 25 to 100 kiloton uh, plant. Uh, and that's a brief overview of the problem we're trying to solve, our approach and, uh, and roadmap. So uh, I could turn to the questions now. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Michael. We are, we'll see. So, uh, as you can see on the bottom of your screen, there is a Q and A space, and uh, uh, so far uh, there is no specific question for you. But I do have one. Well, you have uh, answered my part of my questions with your presentation. But uh, the question I have is, what would be uh, the raw material for your uh, demo and commercial scale? Uh, enterprises. So with the CCAP demo trials it will be sawdust from a Swedish sawmill. Uh, this is now burnt uh, on, on site. Uh, the sawdust doesn't really have a high value application. So we'll be using sawdust uh, and apply our uh, acid sophologis to, uh, to this feedstock to produce cellulose which CCAP can use to make ethanol as they do now. Uh, but uh, this way they'll have using their existing reactor uh, a liquid ligand and product coming out uh, for which we see uh, a lot more market applications than for the for the, the lignin polymers they would other be producing. Um, we do see a link with, with biopolymers. Uh, that's one of the questions. In fact, uh, we have uh, done uh, trials in 3D printing, making filament with, uh, with PLA, uh, for example. 
uh, but also uh, other biopolymers, essentially anything within, uh, that's an, as an aromatic base, uh, like PEF or, or other uh, compounds, it's cyclic and has some uh, polarity, would be uh, compatible with uh, the lignin oligomers. So, so our lignin oligomers are in fact a, a thermoplastic material. We can tune the glass transition temperature by playing with a solvent and put it anywhere between, let's say, 30 degrees Celsius to uh, above 150. So we can play with the glass transition temperature quite easily. We've made rubber kit-like material and also extremely brittle uh, material, depending on process conditions. Uh, another question is how are applications of ligno oil in the marine field? Uh, this is interesting uh, also to, to all the attendees here that we're uh, going to apply for a BBI flagship project with a deadline September 3rd. This will be a budget of about 20 million and the parties that have committed so far I'm allowed to share are Seacup and Maersk, Maersk being a large uh, shipping company. And Maersk has announced uh, at the end of last year that they believe very much in sailing on alcohol, specifically that they believe on sailing on a blend uh, of ethanol and lignin. They call it Leo, lignin ethanol oil. Uh, and the added value of lignin is to bring down the price of ethanol, which of course, uh, especially the second generation variety, will be too expensive to sail on. Uh, so in the marine field, we very much believe in uh, an alcohol carrier. Why? because ligno ligomers are polar if, uh, and alcohols are also polar. If we want to use lignin in distillate fuels, we A, have to crack it because it's going to be too heavy and B, have to remove all the uh, polar groups. Uh, so in the end, a gigajoule produced that way will be about twice as expensive as if you can just simply solubilize it in an alcohol carrier. Um, we have worked with all lignins imaginable from former Soviet countries that are still available now in huge mountains that send us briquettes uh, that works uh, soda lignin craft lignin um, hydrolysis lignin um, not all have the same yields uh, so some lignins are extremely condensed uh, and, and non-reactive to the point that uh, even if we turn on the espresso machine <laughs> to a very hot position there's still no no reaction going on so it's a uh, a uh, basic rule of thumb is if you can't analyze your lignin uh, and solubilize it in THF to do the analytics, it probably will not work uh, in our process. But if you can solubilize in THF and measure like GPC, so molecular weight profiles uh, and the like, NMR, to look at the functional groups, if this works, these analytics work, it will most likely work in our process uh, as well. Uh, is it organosol technology? We, we take this one and then and then you can continue replying uh, on your own. Okay, so and please uh, go ahead with this one. So organosol is typically also with, with with water in the system. We don't use water in the system. We use uh, bone dry biomass and then organic solvent, uh, methanol or ethanol. Uh, and the final one. So we're not using steam explosion. We're replacing steam explosion uh, as the recipe, but you we keep the steam explosion reactor hardware. And then I think we have most of the questions. Uh, hey, thank the rest, uh, be, be happy to answer at, at, a, at a later stage. Part, we will see if we have time also. So I will introduce myself as a, uh, Mm, speaker on behalf of uh, a, a company that is producing synthetic leather from agricultural waste. So, Innovative Biomaterials, it is a company which is based in northern Italy and uh, it has on the market on fully commercial scale, a uh, synthetic leather, which is made from, as you can see uh, from, from, from the picture here, this was not what was left of the celebration for uh, reaching the market, but it is actually the raw material. It is grape mark uh, waste from uh, winemaking. And the target market and the niche that has been identified by Vigia uh, as a high-end, high-added value application for their product 
is the fashion industry. The fashion industry has an inherent problem of huge environmental footprint. Uh, it, there is an over-exploitation of natural resources regardless of the fact the fabrics or the, uh, um, the, the tissues, the, the materials are uh, natural materials such as cotton or uh, synthetic polymers. Uh, some of the unit operations in the, in the fashion industry, for example, tanning of leather, uh, are uh, especially detrimental for workers. There is a number of chemicals and toxic substances that are used, and this work safety problem has not been entirely solved all over the world yet. Uh, there is a huge amount of, of waste that has been properly disposed, and of course, uh, very high carbon emissions. The concept of Vigia is the production of synthetic leather uh, by tackling the value chain of this production from two sides. The upstream side is uh, uh, to use grape mark. Grape mark is the leftover of grape pressing for uh, wine making. And downstream is a high added value product which is a new bio-based and low environmental impact synthetic leather. As you may understand, this uh, product uh, has a commercial and marketing advantage on two fronts. One, the one we all uh, advocate, it is a, a, a bio-based and circular product. But then, of course, uh, it is also a cruelty-free alternative to animal derivatives, uh, as you know, uh, leather is. Uh, there is a, a large market for uh, leather and <coughs> sorry, synthetic leather uh, alternatives. In fact, uh, fossil-based synthetic leather uh, is the largest uh, one on the market right now, <coughs> with around 80 billion euros per year uh, market share and a growth, uh, steady growth of 7 to 8 percent or even more. Natural leather is, of course, growing, uh, growing less. Uh, over, over, compared to synthetic leather, uh, the synthetic le bio-based leather has the additional advantages of uh, having a, a lower environmental impact, uh, being a circular product, and being made from a renewable resource, actually waste. And of course, um, it, it does not impact animal uh, welfare. Uh, currently, there is an industrial production implemented. So here is some, some small numbers that you see from about uh, the grape amount that takes to produce 10 liters of wine. One will obtain two and a half kilo for, of grape mark. From these, one square meters of the current uh, Vigea product. Uh, uh, you, you, sh you should, just to, to put, you, put the thing in perspective and on the scale, with uh, uh, a a fraction of the grape mark, a fraction of the grape mark that is produced in one of the uh, wine producing regions in Italy, I'm talking about Piedmont, Vegea is able to produce uh, in the order of the hundreds of thousands of square meters product, therefore satisfying um, a large demand from brand owners. Uh, some technical uh, some technical details, at least the ones that uh, I'm allowed to disc disclose, disclose. Grape mark is, of course, a seasonal product, and therefore, to ensure continuous production, it has to be uh, collected in campaigns, and then, uh, as you see in phase two, uh, dried. Therefore, can be uh, so that it can be uh, stored. During this process, there is also separation between uh, grape mark skins and twigs and seeds because uh, the powder from skin and, and twigs is then uh, mixed with the, the one that is the actual polymer, which is a polyester polyurethane copolymer made from, uh, the, um, from uh, using the grape seed oil as a raw material. The resulting compound is a, is a composite compound, and it is then spread on a back, backing textile, a back tissue, to provide mechanical strength. 
Uh, this, this, of course, uh, is a product that has uh, little uh, fossil input, uh, no animal uh, input. It's from uh, vegetable waste material. And it does satisfy the requirements of the market in terms of quality. It has uh, good mechanical pro properties and also uh, very pleasant uh, visual appearance and um, texture. The textile that is used as a backing material is, in this case, according to this concept, made with uh, leftover or overstock fabrics. Uh, the company has attracted a, a large amount of funding in the development phase, and now, as I said, it is in the full uh, production phase. However, uh, the company has very uh, serious and relevant plans for growth and expanding this concept to other European regions and other raw materials. The company has in-house knowledge to uh, replicate and transfer the technology on other diff on different kinds of agricultural raw materials. So I invite everybody that finds this interesting to contact us uh, to discuss potential future uh, collaboration. And please do not focus only on, on wine making and grape mark because uh, the technology is suitable for, for other uh, agricultural waste materials. Uh, this is the end of this presentation. While uh, presenting, I saw that there was a number of questions popping up. And um, I will act as uh, my own uh, uh, my own chairman and my own moderator if i can do now i'm trying to do three things at the same time uh, so uh, here is a question i am working in a fashion startup it is quite difficult to contact vg or have a reply for them well uh, then we'll see what we can do probably uh, i am very well aware of the fact that they receive a huge number of requests and they are very busy working with very large brand uh, owners. Uh, the question is if biodegradability has been measured and I will reply to this question later because right now I am not able to do that. Uh, there is a question on energy intensive uh, in, in, and energy input. No, the process has a very low energy input as compared to all other alternatives. I'm talking about leather on the market. It has actually a lower energy input than uh, the one of uh, fossil based uh, synthetic leather and much lower of uh, energy input compared to natural leather. The textile backing used is, I believe, um, cotton, uh, but I can look that up. But in any case, it is sourced from uh, uh, left, uh, leftover uh, textile and material. The, are there color limitations? Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, probably lighter colors, yes. Uh, but uh, as you can see from the pictures and as it is possible to see on the website, there is a whole palette of colors. And uh, expanding this concept to uh, alternative raw materials will probably, on one hand, maybe introduce new color limitations, but open up to other colors uh, on the other. Uh, the reason of using grapes is that the material is particularly suitable for this technology because grape mark is, uh, once in powder form, gives very good mechanical properties, texture and, and color in its natural form to the product. And grapes contain seeds uh, and, and grape seeds uh, produce a very suitable oil for the production of the polymers. Another question is if the, if the product can be upcycled. Yes, it can be upcycled and recycled. And then uh, another one qu question is the lifespan of the material. If the lifespan of the material theoretically is comparable uh, to the one of uh, uh, synthetic leather, fossil based synthetic leather. Um, but uh, I, can, I can come back to you with more details. Uh, so then uh, let me just read uh, if there are a few more questions. Uh, 
Okay, good. So I can see that the other moderator has helped me and um, uh, the, the person asking the question has left the email. So I will reply other questions uh, via, e via email if there is any. And uh, I will uh, instead leave the floor uh, to the next speaker, who is Uros Novak from the National Institute of Chemistry and also the coordinator of the BioApp platform. And we will all be very happy to hear uh, progress and concepts uh, about BioApp because I believe it is something that is uh, pretty close. Uh, to, to our own mission. Please, Urs, the floor is yours. Thank you. I will present the Bio platform. Uh, it's part of the Bio project, which already ended, but uh, we were quite successful. So the aim of the project, the platform is still going on. Um, here you can see the partners and also the map, since we're a very small country. Um, where it's Slovenia, so it's east of Italy, and we already established a lot of connections, not just through the uh, powerful bio and so on and Vanguard, also to the company. So our model, how we work in this project is to go to the industries and ask them how can we help. We were experts in the biopolymer field, so from the chemistry of it, to the modification, process optimization, and so on. So we do not focus on just one, but we focus on the solutions which were needed for the special industry. The feedback at the beginning was good, and also from 2018, the, uh, it was the right opportunity to tackle the single-use plastic crisis with our solution. So the timing was right. Uh, we focus on the food, cosmetic, and health-related industry, industries. Um, and before going to the, just to showing the, the, what we achieved during the project, so the real uh, business cases, I want to stress out the, the vision that we have. So it's, okay, Slovenia as a small country, has extensive biomass resources, especially living cellulose, but to work on the like large case biorefinery, bio although there are some willing industrial partners, it's not being the, the case. So what are we good at? Because a lot of end users, a lot of industry which are interested in the bio-based um, products, chemicals, and so on, especially uh, plastics, uh, alternatives so we position ourselves in the middle of the chain so we can we have experience uh, working with a lot of types of bio, uh, biopolymers and we are listening to the industry about the needs and so on but what is most important what you figure it out during the first year of our work is that this is not enough because you know industry always cha can change their mind based on the financial and so on um, stuff which is important to them, which we understood. So, but in Slovenia, we have the power of the um, people in the sense that Slovenia is being green, it's part of it, our DNA. So basically, we can really good connect to the EU grid deal or the strategy involving circular economy. But our circular economy, it's not meant that, okay, we will transfer the, the, the biomass resources to one country and then the final product will come in the, in the other part of Europe. So everything should be closed um, in, in, uh, in Slovenia. Um, and also, Slovenia is a good opportunity since because of their size can make, uh, make multi-stakeholder collaboration more effective. And here is the point which it's for us, it was the most important is the circular culture, which includes social enterprises, enterprises, startup innovation ecosystem, creative industries, and that therefore creating new job opportunities for high quality of life. So our mission, okay, we, we contact the largest producers and so on, the largest companies, 
but the feedback from them were okay it's it's good but uh, is it market ready so going step back going to the startups one successful example is for the biomedical application it's called the startup it's called biopolife it's a startup from the university of Trieste, which was a partner of the bio project uh, the goal the goal the goal in the bio project was to increase their um, production of the high added value uh, biopolymer uh, based on chitosan uh, for the biomedical application and they were able to upscale it from a uh, few grams to few kilos and this story ended that uh, they were uh, now they're partly owned by the the biggest uh, um, the world leader producer of agar so Java Biocolloid and what we learned from this experience is now this large company wants okay now do it with our biopolymers some stuff which can be uh, useful for the treatment of different uh, diseases as you can see here uh, another idea it was uh, from this we were finalists in the last year European social innovation competition. So they was to replace these small plastic bottles, which uh, there are like 120 billion of those used each year. So we have developed uh, our shampoo solution with the biopolymer layer, which can replace those. So this is already available on the market. Uh, has a equal a EO equal label. Um, the same goes for the other cosmetics application. So here we can play around with different uh, options. So, but the main goal was to do not um, make the decision about of the disposal of the waste to the society as it's now, but it should be done by the consumer itself. So you will always see zero. So that means that it can be done by the consumer itself. Here, for example, uh, we have one project, the chocolate. So this is made of starch, starch and um, seaweed, uh, some uh, lignin base and, uh, um, and uh, chitosan, another seaweed. So here we can play a lot, but the story is not to replace plastic with something that looks like plastic, but add it something else. Uh, here, the biopolymers itself, and you can add it a lot of natural extract, can be, and it's proven and we already tested, so it's antimicrobial packaging. So, what was the goal of this project, which we work with one of the Slovenian uh, uh, pasta industry? So, can you make a Packaging which could last 60 days because they want to have 60 days and without plastic, and it can be at the end biodegradable. We, we achieve it, however, the price was too high, which is usually the case for, for, for those kind of applications. The same was for the um, one Slovenian startup who is already on, on our market shelves with a uh, uh, plant based uh, burger. And also here, we developed the plant-based uh, biodegradable uh, packaging with them, but the price is too high. So we are waiting for some time that maybe this will be, and we need to scale up, this will be then uh, usable in, in that sense. Uh, what is important is to understand what is the need, what people want or what industry is missing. So. For example, if you're talking about single use plastic, this windows, when you can see through, was a big problem. So we decided to make something about that. And here we have a solution which we use uh, the same biopolymers which are already in the paper, made transferable, and therefore it can be recycled with paper. Uh, technology here still it's available it's in the in the stage as you can see but there is still some uh, some testing to do uh, of course there is also 
for the dogs, for the other animals. Uh, so this wrapping has the already it can has antimicrobial properties. It can be different colors. It can be from different uh, uh, food waste, which are good for the dogs and so on, antivitamin and so on, what dogs need. So basically, we are not doing the packaging anymore, but the food itself. And also in that case, uh, different uh, types of uh, polysaccharides can be used to make those kinds of packagings uh, if they are not in contact with, with direct uh, Water, it's stable for a few years. Uh, this was developed in 2017 already, so we have uh, quite a good experience with those. Then um, another material, it's called fruit fibers. It's not fruit leather, because here we want to achieve something more, new type of materials, not, not uh, mixing with uh, polyurethane or polystyrene that is usually done to make leather-like feeling, but make on our type of uh, materials. As here you can see, we can also make it transparent. Um, this is still in the development, but we are quite happy to collaborate with, with some uh, partners who want, or startups who want to explore this also in their uh, wishes. Um, there is also, except uh, from uh, Mace, which, which we are happy to collaborate, also another great uh, Polish startup company, which uh, are called Maven Lab, who grow their own packaging using SCOBY. Uh, we were, at the beginning, we were collaborating with them and help them in some, giving them some uh, our experience and now they're becoming like, a, I will say, a globally recognized uh, company in, in, in that kind of field. Uh, from the for the scoby packaging as you can see here uh, so we are mostly talking our audience audience is consumers people who will then pressure to the government and so on to change the the, the mindset to uh, to embrace this new technology so it's not just replace something that looks like plastic but add it <coughs> add added value to it in in, in the utilization, so make something smarter. Um, of course, today, since we're young, we're all over the social media, so please, you can learn a lot and, and check us what we do. Uh, we publish almost every day. Um, and that's it from my side, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ulrich, for your presentation. And as you can see in the Q&A section, there, there is some question for you. Are you able to see them? Yeah. Okay, good. The name of the plant-based burger, it's Alt, Alt Burger. Um, how do you introduce sentiment products to your packaging? Um, it, we make uh, like, um, bipolar formulation that means that it's in the liquid then we add different antioxidant and so on uh, materials with antioxidant properties this a lot of options are but we are mostly using te uh, tannins uh, or just extracts for example chestnut or oak and so on which is available on the industrial scale in slovenia so to select which ingredients to use to enhance the properties we always look for the commercial available one. Uh, living based packaging, yeah, we made some of those. Um, however, it's um, not just lignin, so we combined with, uh, uh, with more biopolymers. Uh, we do not find any, like, any end user who will be interested in this. So yeah, we can work on those, but we tried several um, uh, foils, we developed several types of uh, foils with lignin already. Uh, how much interest there from, from buyer? So yeah, interest, there is a lot of interest. So basically it's, it's almost every week there's some new contact, but there is a problem now. It's just how, and we are learning by example. So it's like 
how can we be more successful? So one is just discussing and so on, how this transfer is happening. So this is quite slow, but let's say in a few years, maybe uh, there will be some uh, visual, more visual results, but what else did we learn is that it's not just me. So basically in this bio platform, there is a lot of uh, institutional know-how so from different institutes, from Slovenia, Italy, uh, much from Poland, there's a lot of, and what I do, I connect them. So basically what we don't now do, it's not do everything ourselves, but we just like rearrange based on the specialties. For example, if it's for the paper, we have a, paper institute in Slovenia, if it's uh, polymer and so on, it's uh, their specialties and uh, these um, connections are the quite, uh, quite good to have. Key commercial, uh, should I continue or? Yes, okay. please, please, uh, uh, please continue if you feel like and uh, um, uh, I, I, I can also assist if you if you want. I prefer uh, that we we take questions if if everybody agrees rather than uh, uh, concluding uh, because we are on time. We have a couple of minutes and uh, questions are uh, normally interesting. So please go ahead. Uh, what are your key commercial challenges? So. Myself, I'm a, a scientist and have basically no pressure on this. So basically, at the early response, we want to work with the end users or with the company, with the industry and so on, uh, work with them. So at the end, when this transfer is happening, we do not take that much pressure. But commercial challenges are, for example, now we have a lot of options with, uh, with uh, those uh, cosmetics uh, applications, but since the COVID came, the business uh, for those uh, companies who wants to work on those solutions with us, just say, okay, now we have other priorities. So basically it's, it can be uh, different stuff. Um, uh, regarding the material source, this is some, in some cases can be the case. Uh, that okay, the material itself it's not available at a large scale. However, our niche is uh, going local, so we work with them looking for local resources, which is part of the circular economy as we see it, and uh, work work on those. So what we have, so it's not that everything can be uh, shipped from China. Uh, besides consumers for reduction toilet paper, I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, we are not selling anything. So there is there is a startups or company um, who are willing to work with us based on their needs, on the know-how that we have. So we have like in this three to four years that we're working on those, we have quite a lot of know-how in different uh, areas of biopolymers. So and also the expertise from different phases uh, that we have, because what I'm showing here is just like minor stuff from the, <clears throat> all the work that did not go that good. Are there enough pilot and demo facilities available in the region to get the startups on the value of that? So basically, if you are selling shampoos, Slovenia is a great market for it, based on the, our, uh, Budget market research because we have a lot, a lot of green outside, and the eco resorts in Slovenia or eco hotels are like blooming. And we are selling our solution, which is like uh, to them, and they are like quite uh, happy to embrace it. Um, the facilities to, to make the scale of it here, we came up with two solutions. So, one is to make uh, everything local. So that means that also the businesses we are selling to the local communities. Other is to licensing. And for example, people can do those uh, shampoo, shampoo marbles in their facility because technology that we develop together, it's that it can be done 
in the same place as they do, do shampoo. So they don't need to um, get their packaging from China or some other distributor. They can do everything by themselves in one room. So this is the, also the niche that you're following. So just how to invent something or show the industry and end users something that benefits basically everyone. So win-win. I can, uh, uh, sorry, Urus, may I, may I, uh, now, I think now we have, we have reached the end of our event. Uh, you were, uh, thank you for uh, answering all questions that have been, um, that have been basically all question on pilot facilities to make a concluding remark. Uh, I think that uh, in Europe, we have a, a network of uh, excellent, when it comes to bio-based production, an excellent network of, I will not name them, but th there is a list. And they have uh, fantastic uh, equipment and expertise. In my experience, uh, it is still very difficult to fund a pilot study, even though so you rent one of those for a, a campaign, we are still talking about um, dozens of thousands of euros, something like between 50 and 100,000, depending of course of what you're doing. And this is the typical kind of high risk, high cost um, endeavor that is very hard to, to fund. In, in my opinion and in my experience, the instruments that are available to fund these kind of studies are in place but they are extremely competitive with a very low success rate. So rather than uh, new pilot facilities, I would support the existing ones um, with uh, more, accessible, more accessible funding. Or, well, now I'm saying something trivial, more funding. Uh, I, uh, um, if, if there is anybody who strongly disagrees with this, I, I have the moral obligation of uh, leaving this person the chance of a reply. Uh, otherwise, I will ask Ilaria, who is the other moderator of the event together with me, if she has any concluding remark or if we can um, uh, close the event here. Before leaving the word to Ilaria, I have one final remark. If you feel that your question has not been answered or if you didn't have time to ask your question, please feel free to email me because then with emails, I can keep track of everything that comes in and I can promise that I will address uh, your requests. So Hilaria, please. Yes, of course, uh, uh, every attendee will receive a follow-up uh, email together with the links for uh, to, to, to have a look to the videos and slides. Um, we also um, consider all questions and uh, try to reply for all of uh, those are not uh, yeah, replied during the, the webinar. So from my side, I want to thank you to all panelists for their value contribution and all attendees for their interest in um, discussion. Uh, so I, I believe that this is uh, today the first step toward a more uh, cooperation on the bioplastics and biopolymers fields across Europe. Also take the uh, advantage of the Vanguard initiative and the bioeconomy pilot. So uh, I will send uh, to all attendees uh, uh, updating about the next uh, activities expected by the pilots. And also uh, I'm I'm here and I'm totally willing to uh, contribute on increased cooperation uh, on this field. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody and have, have a good rest of the day. Bye bye everybody. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Cheerio. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye.